just want to announce uh, a few of our uh, next uh, couple speakers. So next week, uh, on Monday, we'll have Bill Harbaugh, who's an economist at the University of Oregon. He's a behavioral uh, economist, and he's going to talk about competitive preferences across age and gender. And we have a special back next week on Wednesday in this room at this time. Simone Sch Schnall from Cambridge University will be here, and she's going to talk about some of her work on yeah. Uh, I'm actually not sure what she's presenting exactly. She works on embodiment, pro-social behavior, cognition. Okay. Okay. Those sorts of things. Which will be very interesting. So please come. Uh, after that, James Andrioni will be coming from UCSD, and uh, and then at the end of the quarter, Allison Gottman. And I forgot somebody. Joel Sachs. Yes. So you said Wednesday. Um, so Wednesday. does that mean we're not having the normal one up next Monday? No. no, we are. It's an extra back. Okay. So special backs happen sometimes during the week, so we can cram up a little bit more science into our week. Okay. <laughs> so today we're really pleased to have Robin Nelson, who is now a new colleague at the University of California Riverside. So we consider the entire Southern California area uh, our neighbors. So um, it's really nice to have Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. From the uh, the two hour way a commute to Riverside, <laughs> which actually shouldn't be that far, but you know how the traffic is, is in Southern California. Today I'm going to talk about uh, my work in Jamaica. And I've done, at this point, a kind of wide range of work, some on adults and now some recent work on children. And I'll talk about both of it. And uh, I look forward to hearing your comments, particularly on the later stuff, because that's the stuff I just started. So <clears throat> this is what I'm going to go through today. First, I'll just talk a little bit about, I mean, we're all very much familiar with kin selection theory. I'll talk a little bit about my orientation uh, towards kin theory and how it plays itself out empirically in my work in Jamaica. I'll talk specifically about uh, the gender dynamics of conjugal unions or romantic relationships in Jamaica and how those play themselves out with regards to health outcomes, childhood nutritional stress, and adult health outcomes in Jamaica. And lasty, what I like to call state-regulated alloparenting in child health outcomes in Jamaica. So that state-regulated alloparenting is my bioanthro take on orphanages in Jamaica. So I actually began my career as a cultural anthropology undergrad and uh, was thinking that I was initially going to go to med school. Then I wasn't going to go to med school. And then I was going to be a biological anthropologist, and here I am. And so a lot of my early orientation to kinship theory was much more cultural, culturally anthropo anthropologically based. And so what I, despite kind of my own feelings about kinship, a lot of what I was reading was kind of this uh, Schneiderian work on this idea that kinship is an analytical scheme that's basically dead. And that kinship in the way that we think about it uh, in kind of US cultural anthropology or, and also British social anthropology isn't particularly useful and that we need to be thinking about things like relatedness or how individuals interact with each other on a daily basis. So like the lived practices of kinship rather than genealogies as kinship. And of course this did not actually bode very well when I started to do more biological anthropology and uh, came across kin selection theory and Hamilton's rule and I've since, since this time been trying to think about how to uh, not necessarily incorporate but at least respect both perspectives in my own work as I deal with living human populations who do kind of have very complicated uh, social relationships and kin relationships. And so of course, we have lots of non-human primate evidence of kin selection and kin bias uh, with affiliation. And this is where I got a lot of my orientation in graduate school was towards non-human primate research. And so then I started to think to myself as I developed my own project, how can I uh, think about these applications or these theories in my own work? And so. Of course, there's a lot of work now on the way that family either protects or harms you, right? So we know that kin are not always beneficial. And this becomes quite clear to me in my own work 
uh, in the Caribbean that kin are often a rich source of resources, but that kin can also be kind of competitive and not helpful, particularly when the environment is risky. And I was speaking to Willem earlier today, and I was saying how I, when I speak about the Caribbean, and particularly Jamaica, it doesn't seem as though you would need to do this, but I do have to begin to explain to folks I've learned over the years that Jamaica is a risky environment. Uh, the murder rate in Jamaica is 10 times that the U.S. per capita. Uh, they've experienced continuous, rather continuous devaluation of the Jamaican dollar over the years. And so that their economic climate is not particularly stable. And so what that results in is folks often leaving, the US, leaving Jamaica and going to Great Britain and Canada and uh, the US for work. And so this Caribbean framework that I have up here presents for you lots of ethnographies on the Caribbean. That's when most of the books are uh, more culturally oriented ethnographies on the Caribbean. But then there's also a small body of work out of the Caribbean from biological anthropological cir cir circles. So you have Peter Gray, who's done some work on testosterone in Jamaica and pair bonding amongst men, and basically how testosterone levels drop quite a bit when men are pair bonded. Uh, with their partners, in, in, and he's done that work all over the world, but he's done a good deal of it in Jamaica. Uh, we know that Bob Trivers has done a lot of work in Jamaica and recent work on uh, finger ratios, digit ratios. And then also Mark Flynn has a large body of work out of Dominica where he is working on child health outcomes and stress. And so I've been looking at both of these, you know, both of these sets of work. So more cultural anthropology work and then also the bioanthro work and trying to think about dynamic ways of considering kin investment in the Caribbean, specifically in Jamaica. And so the place where I work specifically is this town of Mandeville. And uh, Jamaica as a whole is about the size of Connecticut. So it's not a very big island. Uh, the town that I work in is here, and here is Montego Bay, and it's about a two and a half hour ride down from Montego Bay into Mandeville, and that's mostly because you have to travel through mountains to get there, so it takes quite a while to get there. It is a relatively densely packed urban area. It is the fifth largest uh, city on the island, and it's up, as I mentioned, it's up in the mountains. The interesting thing about Mandeville, and I was saying this to Joan earlier, is that it is, um, it's thought to be a very wealthy area. Within Jamaica, Mandeville is considered to be wealthy. It's a place where expats often come back to and build their houses. Uh, it is a largely, or not largely, but there's a good deal of the, of the proportion of the population there that has steady income, which is not the case on many other parts of the island. And it's the site of bauxite mining, and bauxite mining is used for aluminum products. Bauxite products are used for aluminum products, which is a great source of income for Jamaica as an island. All of this being said, Mandeville is not necessarily what we would consider to be uh, very prosperous, if you kind of think about socioeconomic stratification in the US. For the most part, folks in Mandeville would be uh, lower working class or right above the poverty line. Uh, in the U.S. And so you have kind of a very densely populated space that's doing better off than neighboring bigger cities like Kingston, but still folks are struggling from a day, on a day-to-day -day basis for access to resources and those kinds of things. And so I have done um, two different projects there. This is kind of just a scene. That's kind of what Mandeville looks like. It's, it's a in the center of town, which were on the previous slides, it's very densely packed during business hours. It's very, very crowded, and you'd be you know, hustling and bustling to get your things. But then kind of once you leave the, the city center and you move to the outskirts of the city, it's very sparsely populated. And uh, none of this is really used for farmland anymore. But it's very spacious, and it's kind of a sleepy town. You know, everybody, all, everything is shut down by about 6 o'clock, that kind of town. And I've done two projects there. The first project uh, lasted from June 2004 through November 2006, and that's when I did my primary dissertation research as a graduate student, and I've recently started another project, and that began last summer and continued with data collection this summer. And the first project, um, I'll, I'll present two 
bits of finding from the first project that it was mostly on adults, and the second project is on children's health. So with regards to the actual, so you know, we have all these kind of theoretical ideas about kin practice, kin investment, uh, relatedness, all of these ideas. Well, with regards to what is actually happening on the ground in Jamaica, some of the things that you probably already know about um, family structures in the Caribbean, there's lots of evidence to support that in Jamaica. So for example, there is a prevalence of female-headed households. Uh, lots of women are running their households with men who may or may not be uh, consistent participants in their household. They're there some days of the week, they're not there other days of the week, that kind of thing. Going right along with that, there are visiting conjugal unions, meaning that a lot of the individuals that I in, were, were informants in my initial study and individuals that I kind of just know in the community had partners who, would, who were their partners, but they did, were not married, they were not formally married, and the relationship was kind of hit or miss. And this hit or miss can last 20 years. This is not necessarily, you know, the end of a relationship where folks are kind of breaking up and so it's, it's a little bit spotty and then it ends. This is kind of in and out of each other's lives in the form of a visiting conjugal union where they, two individuals do not necessarily live together. This can be very short or this could be very long. There's also lots of informal child fostering and there's lots of evidence for that throughout the Caribbean, uh, which just basically means that folks will be taking care of children that are not their own biological children, but most of the time are related to them genetically, right? So an auntie could be watching a child, a cousin would be watching a child, and what this often results in is a very diverse uh, household composition in a lot of cases, so that you have um, two cousins, a cousin's boyfriend, a niece and a nephew, and then they're in their house together. And those, these houses, uh, these kind of diverse household composition situations can, are also very fluid. Sometimes they last for years and sometimes they only last for months. And I actually spoke to several adults uh, who were discussing the kind of informal child fostering that they experienced as children. And they were discussing how when things kind of got tight in terms of resources, they would just move to a different relative's house rather than be a burden on the, the cousin or the aunt or whomever that they were living with at the time. And then lastly, uh, something that we've heard about quite a bit in other parts of the world and is there's a little bit of evidence in Jamaica and, and now I'm seeing I think more evidence of this with my more recent study is gender child preference. So that uh, Carolyn Sargent has a few articles uh, where she mentions that she thought that girls were being favored in Jamaica. And this was very counterintuitive to me because Jamaica is very patriarchal. And so it was very difficult for me to kind of understand how young girls were being preferred in the home when they were very little. There is more evidence of this, and, and as I'll speak to you later on in the talk, uh, when you work with kids who are living in orphanages, it becomes quite clear, actually, that it seems as though girl children are doing a little bit better than boy children are in early childhood. So the first uh, bit of evidence or discussion that I'll give you guys about my own work is on uh, gender and conjugal unions. Uh, and so this first study I did, uh, I interviewed about 82 adults. It's really 85 adults, but once you kind of knock out those who didn't give you complete data, I have 82 adults in this study. And some of the information that I gathered from them was income, uh, with, with specific reference to age and gender, so did income kind of change as people got older or whether they were male or female. I had gathered a lot of information on individual social networks, so how many friends do you have, how often do you see them, uh, biological kin contacts, educational information. It turns out that Jamaica uh, is on the British educational system, so that kids get tracked at around sixth grade, which would be sixth grade for us, into different kinds of schools, you know, whether they're high achieving or lower achieving. And then at about 10th grade, they have to test into what would be 11th or 12th grade. And so you really have quite a bit of stratification in terms of who graduates at these different stages and how much education they get. And a lot of my informants actually got bumped out of the formal public educational system at about 15 years old or 10th grade. And then that, uh, I got information on place of residence and that of their kin and social context. So did individuals live near to their friends or family or not? 
all of my work, the questions in all of my work are really have to do with what can I find out about social and kin networks and how does this map onto health outcomes? And can I see variability in individual health outcomes that tracks onto the availability of social networks and kin networks? So to complement the demographic information I gathered, I also gathered anthropometric information, um, height and weight for calculation of BMI, subcutaneous fat measures at different places on the body. And for this initial study, I also gathered antibody titers for Epstein-Barr virus. And the way that you do this, which I soon learned was probably not going to be uh, a possibility in the future, is that you take the little lancets that you would use for diabetes testing, and you prick an individual's index finger, and then there are these blood spot sheets that they use in the hospital for newborns. And you literally just collect a few dry blood spots, and you let them sit out at room temperature. It's extremely field friendly. Uh, Tom McDade validated this at Northwestern University. It's a great field method if you work in a place that does not have blood taboos. If you work in a place where there are blood taboos, then you end up pricking yourself and your primary informants every single time you have to collect a blood spot uh, analysis so that you can show your informants that the needles are clean, that you're not going to do anything illicit with their blood, that you have good intentions. And that's what I ended up doing with this first study and still only ended up getting about a 50% response rate for this particular. You know, folks would let me do everything else. They got very comfortable with the questions. I was able to kind of lift up their shirts and take all kinds of subcutaneous fat measurements, but the blood was very much off limits. So I've moved away from blood, as you can imagine. And so with regards to the demographic information that I gathered in this first study, um, almost everyone, there was a split between males and females as to whether they had kids. The average age of the participants in this early study was around 29 years or so, 29 years old. And so there was a split as to who had kids. Most individuals, both males and females, were in relationships at this time. These are sexual relationships. Um, I did not have any access at this time. All of these relationships were heterosexual. At this time, I had no access to gays and lesbians in the community in Jamaica. Uh, as you probably know, there's lots of bias against gays and lesbians in Jamaica. It's very dangerous for folks to come out, so I wasn't able to kind of get that kind of information. Though I did know that there were quite a few lesbians in the community. They were kind of more accepted than gay men, and so I knew them, but talking to them about their personal lives was kind of off limits, right? With regards to work status, more men than women had jobs. And, in, and this is not really as clear as it should be. The jobs that women had typically didn't earn as much money as the jobs that men had, even when women had uh, more education than men. The, there was a real difficulty in kind of getting jobs that paid as well. Uh, or getting a steady employment for a lot of the women in the study. And this, of course, was complicated. It doesn't have to be this way, but it was complicated when women had children. Uh, there was less reliable daycare, uh, external daycare outside of the home. So if you didn't have someone else who could watch your child while you were working, for the most part, a lot of those women, it meant they couldn't work any longer, or at least until their children got home. As in the case in, in many countries all over the world now, almost everyone had a mobile phone. Almost no one had a landline. Folks often didn't have piped in water to their houses, right? But everybody had a cellular phone. And then with regards to a car, almost no one had a car. I mean, it, you know, more men than women. But on the whole, everyone was kind of taking taxis and public transportation. So one of the questions that I began asking people was kind of, you know, if you need money for a taxi, who do you get money for? And that became a really important question because it turned out every single day folks were trying to get that, trying to get that money from somewhere to just do their basic living. With regards to the, the anthropometric data, uh, men were a little bit shorter on average than, than men in the U.S. Uh, go ahead, sorry. So I guess to clarify, yeah. like, if everybody has a mobile phone, does that mean everybody has electricity in their house also? Um, yeah, okay, so most people in my study did have electricity, but the electricity cuts out all the time. And so, and that had nothing necessarily to do with whether they paid the bill or not. It has to do with Jamaican public uh, utility system. I remember one time when I was there, there was a power cut on the entire island. And that power cut lasted about 15 hours. So everyone had electricity, 
more people had electricity than they had plumbing. But the reliability of that electricity was hit or miss. So men were a little bit shorter. Um, BMIs were relatively healthy for the most part, in, in all honesty. So uh, we typically think of about 25 to 30 or so as being overweight. And, and for the most part, folks were a little on the heavy side, but really within the range of healthy. Um, and with regards to the, uh, these are subcutaneous fat measures here, Z-scored. Uh, basically, what that's showing you is that men were a little bit leaner than women with regards to the distribution of fat in different parts of their body. So, <laughs> conjugal unions. So I was telling Joan that I initially had no intention on studying conjugal unions. I was there to study genetic kinship relationships, so brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fathers, children, that's it. And it became very clear to me early on in my study that I was kind of missing a whole dynamic of social interaction that leads to the development of familial interactions if I didn't actually ask questions about people's uh, romantic and sexual relationships. And so this is kind of how this study began. And one thing that is kind of clear from the literature is that there are a few dynamics that are going on with regards to investment interactions in conjugal unions. One of them is this idea of the women's dual role. As I mentioned earlier, Jamaica is a particularly patriarchal space. That doesn't mean, as it doesn't mean in lots of other patriarchal spaces, that women are not responsible for earning money outside the home or at least kind of doing some kind of financial contribution to the home while doing 90 to 100 percent of the upkeep within the home. And so uh, Honda in 1996 published a pretty good paper on how women are expected to do both of these very well. Um, there's also this practice of male absenteeism. And the way that this plays itself out when you're actually doing field work or the way that it actually looks is that men are, I've, I, most of my informants actually ended up including a question that asked men, do you have another woman besides your wife or your girlfriend? And I knew by the time I had, you know, do, was collecting all this data, I knew a lot of the men that I was, was meeting or they were friends of friends and that kind of thing because it was a snowball sample. And the men would look at me and say, oh, Robin, come on, you have to ask me that. And I would say, yes, I have to ask you that. You know that your information is confidential. You know, I'm not going to tell anyone. And they would say, yes, I have another woman, but don't write it down. You know? <laughs> and I would say, OK, OK, OK. So I ended up throwing out that category as to not you know, violate people's trust, because it was clearly something that, while there was an understanding that men had other women, this was not something they wanted discussed. And so I felt like I needed to be respectful of that. But what the, male, the way that that plays into male absenteeism is that men often have several places they can be. And so that they might have children in a home with a partner in one space, spend some nights there, and spend some nights somewhere else. And so that there's not the same kind of reliability of your union that you might see in other places. And of course, this is not always the case. There were some folks with strong marriages, but it was much more common than it was uncommon. And then uh, related to this is uh, this practice of quote unquote linking up. So when I arrive on the island, everyone says to me, oh, Robin, we have to link up. We have to link up, which typically means we just need to talk on the phone. You have to tell, update me on your life and that kind of thing. Horston Miller in 2005 published an article that came out in a book on cell phone usage that was based in Jamaica, this particular article. And it was talking about how women uh, have these long, they went through women's cell phones and they looked at their list of contacts. And they said, who are these people in their contact list? And lots of the people in their contact list were ex-partners. And they said to them, why do you still have all of these ex-partners in your list? And they said, oh, well, we, still, we still link up. We still catch up. And what it really turned out to be was that women could rely on ex-partners for small financial resources when necessary. So uh, you know, a couple hundred Jamaican dollars, which is only three to four US, for a phone card. Uh, a little bit of money for diapers for a child, even if that child was not this par ex-partner's child. And so both men and women have different strategies of investment that, have m that are much more dynamic than we are in a union, so we, you know, we deal with each other, now we're broken up, and so that union is over. It's much more complex than that. And so it turns out that it appears to me that conjugal unions are a form of social insurance to some extent. Yeah. 
there a, a traditional uh, marriage ceremony or ritual, or is that something that only came in? No, there is. So, so Jamaica is a very, very Christian country, um, just because of its kind of uh, history of, of colonialism and, and everything else. And folks, you know, there is a because it's very Christian. There are lots of folks who have been very religious and get married, and their marriages look a lot like ours. White dress, you know, at the church, and and family is all there. But the rate of marriage is very low, despite facts, folks being very religious and wanting to be formally married. And I've spoken to people about a desire to be married. It's not my assumption that they would like to be married. Folks discuss this. But whether they actually ever get married in their life is, is, is up in the air. What is a typical Christian ceremony that presumably came in at the time of the Reform? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we, we only have like very scant evidence about um, what kinds of practices were happening before then, things like jumping the broom and those kinds of things that were happening during slavery. But as far as kind of Jamaican tradition, like if you were to go and say, I would like to have a traditional Jamaican wedding, it would look a lot like ours with maybe different music and different food, right? So one question that I had with regards to my research was, and we have lots of evidence in the public health research that conjugal unions can benefit health, that having an individual that you can rely upon can help uh, fortify your health because you have kind of someone that you can rely on for resources. And so there's a ton, ton of research on that. And there's a little bit of research that says, yeah, if a marriage is bad, though, that's really bad for your health, right? That marriages or unions are only good when they're psychosocially healthy and that if they are very stressful, then it's probably best to not be in those unions. But there's a lot of data that relationships do kind of make a difference in terms of individual health. And so I wanted to know, does duration of conjugal union in Jamaica, because one thing that becomes very clear is that folks are kind of doing a lot of what they call serial monogamy, right? A relationship that's a couple years long and then it ends. Maybe there was a child born of that union, maybe not another relationship starts after that. So I wanted to know, does duration of conjugal union cor correlate to variability in health status for men and women? And then tangentially, but related, how do these romantic relationships reflect culturally specific differential investment patterns by men and women? And so initially, I kind of ran duration of conjugal union as a continuous variable. The only problem with that is that folks don't give you really good finite information on duration of conjugal union. If you ask someone how long they've been with someone, they might say, I don't know, like 10 years? You know, and that's not, that's not very specific with regards to months. You know, if you really kind of want to get at differences, you really want kind of differences in months and those kinds of things. And for the folks at the far end of the unions, 15, 20 years together, they're just guessing. You know, well, we started dating this time, I don't know, something like 20 years. And I would say, well, you know, can you, get, can you be a little more specific? They're like, I, I don't know. You know, th th that kind of level of specificity is not of any practical use for their lives, so they didn't remember that. So I initially ran it as a continuous variable. It doesn't really play itself out at all in terms of health outcomes. Then I said, okay, what if I think about what are culturally relevant categorical groupings for, for length of relationship. So that you have single individuals, folks who are not dating anyone. You have folks who are together a few months to three years, so these like short-term relationships. And then you have four more years, because I actually had very few people who were four more years in my, in my study. And the dependent variables I used were BMI and skin fold thickness for this. So I initially ran this as part of my dissertation research. And then later on, I came back and I said, uh, didn't really like the way I ran it, and ran it again. And it turns out that I was missing something pretty important the first time that I talked about this. Yeah. So the people who have been together for less than a couple of months are single? And so, this is, so this is, again, the level of specificity. And so I would ask people, how long have you been together? And it was a few months. So folks would either tell me single or a few months. But I could never get from folks, you know, two months, a few weeks, you know, a few months was the short-term beginning, yeah, that folks would tell me. And so when I ran this again and we look at body mass index uh, and duration of conjugal union, it turns out that it only approaches significance really for men, this difference in, in whether relationships make a difference or not, duration of relationship. It approaches it for men. 
And when you kind of do an analysis of who is really, who is really impact, making this difference, it turns out that the biggest difference is between single individuals, single men, and men who are in relationships for a few months to three years. And that, and for women, there's no difference at all with regards to their BMI. Duration of conjugal union doesn't seem to matter at all. When you run tri tricep skin fold thickness, again, it only approaches significance for men. And again, it's the same two groups that are kind of having this difference, single individuals and those who have been together a few months to, th to, to three years. So one little interesting piece that I found out once I ran this data and I went back and looked at some of the more kind of ethnographic information that folks had given me was that those individuals, uh, particularly men who had been in short-term relationships, reported to me that they were receiving help, you know, because I'd ask them all kinds of questions. Who watches your kids? Who gives you money for the cab? You know, if you need to go to the doctor, who takes you to the doctor? All these things. Those men in, those, in that middle group were receiving help from both their family members and this new partner that they were with. If you were in a long-term relationship, it was mostly your partner who you were relying on. And if, it, if you were single, it was just your family members that you were relying on. So these folks were getting kind of investment from, from both blood relatives and intimate partners. But it seems to me that this effect of getting dual investment in a risky environment diminishes over time. After a while, your family members are going to say, OK, you're doing pretty well. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go you know, spend my resources somewhere else. You need to rely on your partner for that. And the effect wasn't at all present in women. So that was kind of one of the first things that kind of pointed out to me that there might be gender dynamics to some of this investment that I wasn't paying attention to. And there's gender dynamics that seem to pop up a little later too, which I'll, which I'll show you. So the second piece I was going to talk to you about was a, a paper that I published about a year ago or so. And this was actually using this same data that I had uh, and on adults and asking the question, if I have information on adults and I understand what's happening socioeconomically in Jamaica at different points in time, can I think about what happened in their childhood? Can we kind of track back based on their health outcomes? And so I considered this to be a little bit of a test of retrospection. So do experiences of socioeconomic stress during childhood correlate to measures of adult health? And so the theoretical framework for this work was a little bit different. And this is actually the project that shifted my interests away from adult lives in Jamaica towards children's lives in Jamaica. And so some of the theoretical work, I'll read this stuff out because it's a little darker uh, on the screen. But some of the theoretical framework has a lot to do with kind of life history theory, growth and development of children, and uh, early experiences of nutritional stress and whether that maps onto uh, predisposition towards certain illnesses later in life, like cardiovascular disease and obesity. <coughs> and so I know that the children, so I, in, in putting together all this background research on my work in Jamaica, I knew that Jamaica had had this extremely rough political and economic moment in the 60s and 70s, as did countries kind of all over the, all over the world specifically post-colonial, kind of a post-colonial moment. And I formed this hypothesis that individuals who were children during Jamaica's most economically volatile era, era would have higher BMI and skin fold thickness than their younger and older counterparts. And this kind of maps onto some of the developmental origins of health and disease work, which argues that if you are getting a signal of a risky environment early in life, that your body kind of sets you on a metabolic trajectory towards uh, lower efficiency in order to hold on to resources, lower efficiency with regards to caloric usage. And so this is the same study population, and that's kind of what Mandeville looks like during the middle of the day. The key, the study population that I was working with was born between 1961 and 1970, 1988, excuse me, and I was very much interested in the years of 1962 to 1977. And so what was going on with regards to political stuff at that moment in Jamaica? 
is that in, Jamaica had gained independence from Great Britain in 1962, and there was a political and economic upheaval that went along with that. And so by 1978, you had a 48% inflation. Uh, the IMF uh, had continuous policies throughout the 60s, 70s, well, 70s and 80s that resulted in a continual devaluation of the Jamaican dollar, which means, you know, basically you could have the same amount of money and it's just not going to get you as far. So go goods are just more money and you just don't have the same resources. There was a restriction on imported goods. And this, this restriction on imported goods actually turned out to be very interesting to me because I was in people's homes and I realized, and I remember asking one of the older women in my study, I said, why do you have three bottles of oil, like, you know, cooking oil? Because there's lots of stores in, in, in Mandeville. It's not a, kind of a difficult place to kind of get stuff. And so I said, well, you know, why do you have three bottles? She was like, you don't know when that's going to happen again. You don't know when, when the restrictions are going to happen again. So this was like a lived memory for lots of my informants, that there was a moment when you could not get the most basic goods in Jamaica. So what happened during this time when all this was happening is that there was a 338% increase in migration out of Jamaica at that time. Folks were fleeing. And so if you go into Boston, Miami, New York, uh, Toronto, and there's kind of an older generation of folks, say, in their 60s now, and you ask them when they left, the vast majority left during this moment in Jamaica. And so the question then remains, who's left in Jamaica? If you couldn't leave, because most of the folks who left were middle class, squarely middle class, they had family members abroad, they could get their visas and whatnot. So who was left in Jamaica? Well, of course, it turns out that the folks who were left in Jamaica were the folks who were kind of hardest hit by this crisis. And so there are these very early studies uh, by Ashcroft and Lovell from the 1960s that basically look at uh, Jamaican school children. And they are considerably, uh, and actually Ashcroft and Lovell did these studies on kids living in the mountainous areas of Jamaica, which was probably where my research is done. That's as specific as they got with regards to their research. But they show that, that these kids are considerably smaller than their British counterparts, and they're considerably smaller than kids who were living in the capital in Jamaica during this time. So there was already some evidence of stunting happening really early on in the 60s. And then this map is actually just showing you government expenditure on health and education right around the 60s. It kind of goes down quite a little bit, quite a bit there. And so what we see when we start to kind of play out the data that I have is that there is a significant increase with BMI with age. This isn't surprising. This happens kind of all over the world. We see folks get a little bit heavier as they get a little bit older. And we see this with men and with women. And there was also a significant increase in skin fold thickness with age. And again, this happens with men and with women. But then when you start to kind of play out uh, specifically the age groups that I'm looking at, I broke my study sample into different age cohorts. And I looked at folks who were born 1979 to 1988. Those were the youngest people that I interviewed. Then 1969 to 19, I mean, sorry, 1979 to 1988, 1969 to 1978, 1959 to 1968, and then 1946 to 1958. And what we found was that there were significantly lower BMI values for the youngest group of women and they were significantly lower than the next two age cohorts. And that this happened again with skin fold thickness, and with men and women with skin fold thickness. And so we can just say that, OK, well, it seems that the youngest people were healthiest. And that's what we see in a lot of populations. But I think there's something else going on here. Um, part of the reason why I also think something else is going on here is because there is a disassociation in this population between BMI and socioeconomic status. So in a lot of places, you'll see folks get a little bit older, their metabolism gets a little bit slower, they get a little bit heavier, and if their SES is low, then they're more likely to kind of gain extra weight. Well, we don't have that connection in this particular population. And I'm not sure that those kids who were born into 
a better environment, 1979 and 1988, are going to track the same way that the older generation has. And so the kind of next thing that's needed is a longitudinal study that follows those folks to see if they have the same age-related increases or if the heaviness that we see with the two older age cohorts has something more to do with what they experienced as children. Oops, sorry. So lastly, what I was going to talk to you guys about, I really want to hear your feedback on because I've literally just started analyzing this data, is the work on, on state-sponsored or state-regulated alloparenting and children's health. And so when I did that project where I looked at the study population I had and asked a kind of post hoc question about their childhood, I started to ask myself, well, you know, what is the social context of childhood in Jamaica? You're kind of asking a question about what happened to people when they were children without actually, you know, having the opportunity to speak to them when they were children. What if you study children's health in Jamaica? I wanted to know how the context or idea of childhood changes by age for kids, changes with regards to socioeconomic status, and with regards to home environment, and how this environmental variability impacts child growth and development. And so the children in the top picture are actually children who are living in children's homes or orphanages in Jamaica. And the, the little boy in the bottom is with his mother there. And so one place that I wanted to start, because I realized there's actually a dearth of information on this, was children's homes or orphanages. I was speaking, I think, to Willem, and I was saying that folks don't even know that there are orphanages, actually. So there is a real ethos of child care and strong matrifocality in Jamaica. And so I would be speaking to some of my informants, and they would say, oh, you're back on the island. Are you just back to do the same project again? And I said, no, no, no. This time I'm working on children's homes. And they're like, we have children's homes. They knew they had their children's homes in Kingston. But Kingston is considered to be you know, a crazy, dangerous place. So of course, there would be orphans in Kingston. And then I said, they said, oh, you're going to work on children's homes, so you're going to go to Kingston. And I said, no, there's six, six homes in Manchester Parish. And Manchester Parish is very small, smaller than Riverside County. It's very small. And folks were absolutely shocked to find that there were that many children who did not have homes in Manchester Parish. And so I wanted to understand what was going on with these children with regard to parental loss if the homes are providing an idea of new family. So is this alloparenting in the way that we think about it in biological anthropology or not? How are children coping with a socially, socially with this alloparental environment? And can a children's home be reparative with regards to health? And part of the reason why I was asking that question is because I went into this study having read lots of research from orphanages in Eastern Europe. And that's where a lot of the, the orphanage data comes out of. And so, you know, a lot of that data is, you know, these kids are terrible, they're doing terribly, they're neglected, they have speech delays, they're stunted, you know, really bad health outcomes for children. And so I'm going in with a very kind of uh, unidirectional hypothesis about how these kids are going to be coping with living in the orphanage and what their care would look like, what investment would look like for these kids. And uh, I was wrong. So I have to ask different questions. So the study participants in this, in this study were four months to 17 years in age. Uh, and I also interviewed quite extensively the child caretakers, so the folks who were providing the care for these children. The sample was three out of the six children's homes in Manchester Parish. So I was able to kind of interview half of, uh, half of get into half of the homes and at the homes, once I was there, I got about a 95% response rate. The kids knew they did not have to do it. Uh, I told them that right away, but most of the kids did it and they didn't really have a problem with it and they went about their business. And so some of the ethnographic information that I gathered, and that's my research assistant who, because she's fantastic in Jamaican Patois because she is Jamaican, she conducted all of the research, I mean all of the interviews with the children because the children actually felt much more comfortable with her. and and were comfortable kind of just speaking freely with her. Whereas with me, they were like kind of always looking at me like, you kind of look Jamaican, but you're not from here, and where are you, and I don't know how much information to give you, and that kind of thing. So uh, my research assistant, Bridget, did the interviews, and I did the, uh, the health assessments. 
And so I asked them their age, their number of siblings. I asked them activity levels, you know, like, what do you like to do? How often do you get to do it? What's your favorite games? Those kinds of questions. Their school histories, you know, uh, you're in school now. Have you always been in school? When did you go back? Those kinds of things. Uh, ask, I asked them about access to medical care, and they had lots of, it was really interesting. You could ask a six-year-old, you know, do you go to the doctor? Yes, I go to Dr. You know, Crawford in Mandeville. Okay. <laughs> you know, they knew exactly the last time they had gone. They, I went before my school visits. They knew, they knew their whole kind of medical stuff. I asked them about quality and quantity of friendships. Who are your friends? What do you do together? How often do you see them? Because there was this question about, do they have friends that are mostly in the home, or friendships that are outside of the home and in the school. And then some broader questions about psychosocial and financial support networks. So I'd ask them questions about whether they had a cell phone and if they wanted to get a sweetie at the market, who would they ask for money, and those kinds of questions. And then with regards to the anthropometrics, I took uh, height and length, length for the younger kids, of course. Uh, weight measurements, subcutaneous fat at the superiliac, tricep, and subscapular locations blood pressure, mid-upper arm circumference, and head circumference for the little kids. And my intention initially was to take saliva samples for cortisol levels. This was, this was like, I was very excited about this and had all of these supplies. Uh, the shipping the cortisol out of Jamaica is not reliable. And so it turned out that I actually couldn't collect the cortisol because, uh, or collect the saliva because you have to ship it out within two days or it'll go bad. And it has to stay frozen and it has to get to the lab. And I just pictured, you know, uh, 125 or 250, because I really wanted multiple samples from each kid, saliva samples, you know, growing green stuff inside of them at the airport while they waited to be shipped out. So until I figure that out, we have to wait on that part of the research. And so the mean age for this study was uh, 9.85 years of age. And I had 125 kids in the study. And you can see that there's a peak right around, say, 12 years or so. We had a lot of kids who were around 12 years of age. And I should say that one of the really interesting things about this study that I was not expecting, even though I had a, like a rough idea about all the homes before I got there, two out of those six homes are only for boys. And I was kind of shocked to find that out, actually. I was not, I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't think there were any single gender homes. I'd spoken to the caretakers. That was not mentioned until I got to the homes. And I would say, okay, so where are the girls? And they said, oh, this is the all boys home. You didn't know. And I was like, okay, it's the all boys home. So that happened. So one, the first kind of stage of questions that I had was, is resident home residents home correlated to variability in health outcomes for boys and girls and the reason why I asked this question was because it was very clear to me upon visiting these homes that uh, all orphanages are not created equal and that they are all kind of run by different churches but the kind of care that the kids were getting and the level of investment from those caretakers was quite variable and so some of my preliminary findings is that resident home, residents home is, is significantly, significantly excuse me, correlated to variability in BMI Z-score in boys. With the one boy's home, Mount Olivet, those boys were far healthier than the boys in the, specifically in Windsor Lodge, which is another home. And in all honesty, that's not surprising to me. The, the caretaker at Windsor Lodge, the woman who ran the entire place, was the most open, she wanted a psychiatrist on hand. She was trying to hire a psychiatrist for the kids to have access to. Uh, she just had kind of very interesting and dynamic ideas about child health that were not expressed to me by the other two caretakers. But it is interesting that a single sex environment is providing this kind of care for these kids and I kind of want to know more about that. And then I ran mid-upper arm circumference as well without z-scoring it because in some measures of um, extreme health, folks will look at just the regular, uh, regular MUAC scores without doing a z-score. And a residence home, again, was significantly correlated to uh, variability in MUAC in boys, and specifically Hanbury Home, another one, of, Windsor Lodge and both Hanbury Home were both run by the Salvation Army. And in this case, Hanbury Home, the kids at Hanbury Home were not doing as well as the other two kids. So in conclusion, there seems to be real gendered practices in familial and social relationships that seem to shape health outcomes. 
investment is variable and based on resource availability, which we could all predict, but I've kind of found that over the years that understanding cultural practice around things like relationships and parental investment is essential to understanding the context of this investment. That going in kind of blind doesn't really give you any idea of, uh, you can't, it's even difficult to make predictions about investment without understanding those, those, cultural, those cultural factors. And so additionally, I'll be doing analysis on the child health data. Uh, I'll be, the next field season, I'll be doing collection from children uh, living with biological family members so that I can kind of compare some of their life, their life events with those kids who are living in orphanages. One thing that's really missing from a lot of the Caribbean data is a longitudinal health data on adults. It's just kind of not there. And I was saying earlier that part of the reason why is because Jamaica is a very difficult place to work. Lots of other places in the Caribbean are kind of difficult to work in. And so, uh, actually, I bumped into Mark Flynn at a meeting, and I told him I wanted to work in Jamaica, and he laughed at me and said, good luck. I probably should have known better then, but I just forged ahead. So there's a reason why that, that data set is missing in the Caribbean. I think that we need to figure out some more field-friendly biometric uh, ways of assessing things like cardiovascular health and obesity because some of the more, the ways we typically think about doing this, like blood samples, don't work in all contexts. And also I'm very much interested in a pan-Caribbean uh, perspective in a diasporic project. So what are Jamaicans doing in other parts of the world and how do Jamaicans with regards to their health compare to those folks living in Barbados and other places in the, in the Caribbean? So. I just want to thank you guys for having me, uh, particularly Dr. Silk for inviting me. Uh, the Department of Anthropology at UC Riverside has been extremely supportive. The folks at Northwestern gave me a bit of my training. Uh, Michigan gave me my initial support for this work. And Dr. Boyer at um, the University of Pennsylvania has been uh, a mentor of mine, an informal mentor of mine. And then, of course, my participants at, in Jamaica and the Wintergren Foundation for funding. Thank you.